This is the Entrepreneurial CPA Podcast, teaching millennials how to think outside the box to become entrepreneurial leaders by reconceptualizing the industry they're in. Brought to you by C3 Evolution Group with your host, Garrett Wagner. Today, we are lucky to have Ed Benowitz to be part of our podcast. Ed is a partner at Witham Smith & Brown PC and has over 40 years of public accounting experience. He is accredited in business valuation and forensics as a personal financial specialist. Ed is also admitted to practice and has argued cases before the United States Tax Court. Ed is the author of 25 books and has written over 1,000 professional articles and 250 CPE programs. Ed's practice management techniques have been reported on by numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal and the Journal of Accountancy. And he was an MBA instructor for 11 years. He is also one of Accounting Today's 100 Most Influential People. Ed, welcome to the program. Hi, Gary. Thank you. Welcome. Great to be here. Yeah, we're very excited to have you. You've, you've done an amazing amount of stuff over the years, whether it's the books, the CPE, the articles. It seems like you're always putting out something. What, what helps you put out so much content um, so often? Do you just have a, a gift for writing or...? Well, actually, I, I'm, I'm a good writer now, but I never was a good writer. I did not start out as a good writer, and I give a lot of speeches now, and I did not start out as a good speaker. Um, at one point in my practice, and this goes back a long time ago, uh, I, I felt that my, my small firm needed a tax specialist, a tax, you know, someone to, to do, handle the taxes. And... Uh, I put together a list of criteria. At that time, I was an, I was the audit guy, and I put together a list of criteria of um, what I wanted in a tax person. And one of the things was that he had to be able to write articles and give speeches, because in, in those days you could not advertise or promote yourself. But if you wrote an article, you got the firm out there and you gave a speech because you, you met people. And I put that down as a criteria. We, we did not, we were not able to get a tax person, but we were e- able to get an audit person. It seemed it was easy to get an audit person. So the audit person replaced me, and I became the tax person. So as part of my job, I had to write articles and give speeches, because that's what I said tax persons should do. And I started writing, and the first time, I remember I wrote an article, and this is before computers and all this other stuff. I had a typing service, typed the same article 12 times as originals, and I sent it to 12 publications, and all 12 turned me down. And uh, so I, I wasn't able to get published. And then by accident, I met somebody, uh, purely by accident, who um, is, we started talking, and I mentioned he, he published a magazine or a newsletter, and I mentioned that something was in it that I would have handled differently. So we said, could you record the, the conversation? And he wrote it up, made it into an article, and I became an author. <laughs> and, and another time, I uh, didn't give much speech. I really didn't give speeches. And um, a client of mine had a girlfriend who was an assistant producer for one of the TV news programs in New York, and they were going to interview an accountant, and she uh, called me, mentioned my, my client's name, and asked if I could give her a list of questions she could ask, they, they could ask the uh, accountant. So I was on the phone with about a half hour, and she said, you know, you seem very nice. Would I mind doing it, and they'll get rid of the other guy? I said, sure. They said the camera crew up to my office, and now it became a TV star. <laughs> So the things happen by accident, and I tell you, the thing that I think made me the most successful is not that I aggressively look for opportunities or even, uh, you know, went about trying to find the opportunities, but if an opportunity came my way, I never let it pass me by. So I'm an expert at taking the opportunities that, that I tripped on and hit me in the face. And as opposed to really going out there and trying to make the opportunity. So what my advice to, to my colleagues is very simple. Don't piss up the opportunities that come your way. You only get to get one shot at each thing. If you're too busy, 
you don't think you can do it, you don't want to do it, it's not the right time, you're giving up the opportunity. I never gave up those opportunities. And yeah, and that, that's my advice. It's just, I see that a lot of times in the young kids coming out of college, you know, the new generation where they're, they're hesitant sometimes to take on a new project or task. They're worried it's not going to work out or it could fail. And you're right. They've got to just take that leap and, and go for it. That's the only way you ever get that chance. Like you said, you get this unique opportunity like to be on TV or to, to meet someone to do an article, and you've got to just take a shot at it. And, you know, like you said, nobody's great at it to start with. It just comes up. I, I, something happened last week. I, I, I'm, I'm involved with a committee in New York, an accounting, uh, the Accounting Club of America. And Barry Melanson, the chairman of the AICBA, spoke last week. Well, I've been trying to get young people from my firm to go with me to the meetings. And I ended up getting two, two young people who, who came to, to a couple of meetings. Now, now I would say, I, I spoke to a dozen or 15 people, and, and two people took me up on it. And they ended up at this breakfast with Barry Melanson speaking. As soon as the breakfast was over, I said to them, come with me. We'll get, a, we'll get our photo taken with Barry Melanson. That afternoon, there was a, the photo, along with a story that the, that the editor wrote, uh, was in that issue of accounting today. So they, they got their photo in, in a national accounting uh, newspaper with the head of the AICPA because they took an opportunity that that a dozen other people turned me down on. And now I'm, I'm, I'm friendly with them and I'm nurturing them and I'm exposing them to more opportunities. And we have taken them under my wing. And the, and the reason why is not because they're, they're, they're exceptional people, but not because they're exceptional, because they took me up on on the opportunity that came by them. Yeah. So that's an example that's happening right now. Yeah, because you're right, because it's, it's like you said, it's not because they're the best gap technical expert at your firm or the most proficient tax code person. Like you said, it's, you presented them an offer and they took up on it. And I bet they learned some stuff, too, while they're at that, um, that seminar as well. Oh, he was Barry Johnson was talking about the state of the profession. He was fantastic. It was uh, actually it was in last Tuesday's accounting today. A story about Barry Johnson and, and in, uh, there's two photos. Uh, one is of, of the Capitol building in Washington, and the other is me with the two kids, two kids, two young men, and Barry. So, um, that, you know. I, for me, it was good, but for these these two uh, young people, it was fantastic. First time they got the picture anywhere, and they were with the head of the AICPA. Yeah, and that's great. This will lead to other opportunities. I, I put on a CPE program this morning. I, I invited them to attend. It was for accountants only, and but I invited them to come, you know, to attend it. And they they both told me how much they liked it. So don't piss up opportunities. Yeah. How does Witham, uh, does Witham mind that you do a lot of non-traditional work while you still do some traditional work? Are they very good about balancing those two different career types? Well, uh, I had this partners network. We had 20 people in, in my New York office, 20 accountants for free, small practitioners. And we're going to have 60 accountants Monday night in New Jersey for free as part of this Partners Network program, and it's paid for by Witham. And plus we have money to spend on promotion and a lot of other things that go along with this program, including marketing people have to work on it. So what do you think Witham's attitude is toward this? They love it. That's Additionally, I, I, um, I send out every year updated checklists to um, – Accounts, uh, I, I call them tax season checklists, but uh, there's 66 checklists. I think I sent them to you yesterday. Yep, yeah, One of the checklists, in, in that checklist package, is, is the Whipping Dress for Your Day Manual. It's a 12-page manual that the firm rolled out last month on our dress code. And uh, they used a dozen uh, people from our firm. Well, I they gave me permission to include that uh, manual in the checklist. 
So everybody that gets the checklist is going to have the 12 page with a dress code. So I would say that with them supports what I do and what this program is uh, tremendously. Of course, the accountants that attend these things uh, recommend us to hundreds of thousands of dollars of business of things that they can't do or not able to do. You know, like well, audits, bonus, yeah. pension plan audits, uh, audits of, of large not-for-profit firms, uh, business valuations, forensic work. Uh, so we get a lot of, uh, you know, we get a lot of business from this. So Witham supports this uh, completely. I've always been very impressed with Witham because they have, um, they've got three different partners, including yourself, who are kind of seen as big thought leaders in the profession. Um, so what do you think is unique about the firm culture that helps have so many industry-wide thought leaders that exist in one firm? Well, the culture is great, and um, I'm, I'm going to tell you two things that indicate this. Uh, more than half of our firm's partners started with the firm, uh, which is very unusual for firm. We have about 90 partners. Half of them started with the firm, and our CEO, which is Bill Hagerman, actually he worked for someplace for a year, and then he came to with them, and his rest of his career has been with us. So his whole career is with us. Jim Burke, who is on the, another one of the 100 influential accountants, uh, he, he's one of probably the biggest thought leader in public accounting today. He he, he just made he just finished his thirty he just reached his thirtieth anniversary milestone at Witham, only place he worked. And Tony Nitty, who uh, is also a uh, he he writes the Forbes um, uh, dot com uh, tax blogs. He's also he he was on that he wasn't on the hundred most influential list, but he was in one of the the, the people that to look at, you know, yep, saw that. His, his whole career was with us also. Uh, in my office um, in New Brunswick, there's two two people are being made partner um, next next July first. One of them started with us as an intern, and the other one moved here after she she had one year experience working in Boston. She moved to New Jersey, got a job with us. And her whole career was with us, except for that one year when she was in Boston. <clears throat> so there's a consistency, there's a culture here, which is very good, but there's also a consistency to the culture. Uh, we have people running the firm, we have partners who, who grew up, and of course staff, who grew up in the firm. Now, this Dress for Your Day book, uh, which is, which is in the checklist, um, you know, this is a you know if you figure out how much something like this costs, plus we made a video to to show to everybody, this stuff is expensive, but but it enforces the culture and it takes away vagueness of what we expect. The other thing is we we just every year we have a state of the firm video, and anybody could go to you to YouTube, put in with them Smith and Brown, and you could view our videos. Which have won awards, which what the first one we did had over a hundred thousand uh, hits or downloads or whatever you call it, views from YouTube. So, at, at one of the uh, videos had over two hundred staff and partners in it, and you can look at it; it's all young people. In fact, like more than half of our firm are millennials. We got eight hundred fifty people. Over 425 of the 850 people are millennials. Now that's impressive. That's really, really, that we're a 40 year old firm. Yeah, we're a 40 year old firm. And we're a young firm. And we, we just cut out, uh, mandatory nights and mandatory, uh, uh, weekends. And people, the staff gets a budget of, you know, they have a workload that they have to get done. Of course, there's client requirements. If they have to be at a client at night or on a weekend, uh, for some reason, they got to do it. But for tax season, we, everybody has a workload, and they have to get the workload. So they decide when they want to do it and where they want to do it. They want to work and at home a, or they work at home. Yeah, that's the shifting world. world. Yeah, that we're moving into. And it's great the to see a firm like you guys. Go ahead. 
you know, the world is shifting. You know, um, the, the iPhone, I think, is not even 10 years old. Facebook, Google uh, are all new things. Uh, the, 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 uh, the technology, the, the uh, smart scanners for tax returns is, is not even 10 years old. In fact, when I started in accounting, I don't want to tell you how old I am, but when I started in accounting, we did not have copy machines. Go figure that out. So, yeah. so things now they don't have copy machines either. They're, sca- they're high speed scanners that go right to computers. Occasionally, you want to you want paper. To, you want to make something out of paper. Things are changing. We, we have, I think, we have the best technology of any accounting firm. We're certainly at the forefront of everything. And Jim Burke, who, who heads this up, uh, speak, I think he, he speaks to, uh, I know he speaks to more than 100 accounting firms a year. He, he doesn't do consulting for clients for, for technology. He only does consulting for CPA firms. And he, he's with 100 firms a year, at least, not counting conferences and stuff that he speaks at. Uh, so I think we have the best technology. Everybody in our firm gets an iPhone, or, or uh, you know, they, they, if they if they don't want an iPhone, they want something else. They can get it, and we you know we hook it up to our system. Um, everybody, of course, you know, I, you know, computer. They didn't have computers, of course, when I started. Everybody now has a laptop, has a notebook, computer. Yep. A lot of people have uh, the uh, the Surface. Yep. That, that they oh, yeah. use, which so so a, the culture is is lived every day. The management works at it. We we respond. Oh yeah, I tell you something else. W- one of the two people from my office is a, is a woman who's good at, who's a part timer. She she could be a part time partner. We we had we had a part time partner, a, a woman who was made a part a part time partner ten years ago. She made a career decision in the 1990s. That, that she wanted to be at home when the kids went to school, and she wanted to be there when, when they came home from school. So the friend says, fine, you have a job forever. Do, do it, work any way you want, any hours you want. This is even before the paperless stuff. And we made a appointment 10 years ago, Marine de Seco. I'm fantastic. We have, we have uh, I don't know how many, but uh, in my office, uh, we, we have like 10 offices, but in my office in New Brunswick, we have Green is part-time, Sherry Ranko is a part-time partner, Nina uh, Chimera is going to be a part-time partner. We have three women that are going to be part-time partners in my office come July 1st. We, I think we were the first uh, 10 years ago to make a, uh, a woman who was not a full-timer a, a partner. That's great. So culture, you can't beat, I, really, you can't beat our culture. It's, it's fantastic. I merged in 12 years ago with three other firms, who all st- except for the partners who retired, you know, and, and went away, uh, we're all still there. We're all, we're all still, uh, still involved. We all have offices. Uh, when we get all the all the facilities and everything that the firm has to offer. That's great. You guys are clearly, you know, leading the charge what a new firm should look like. Do you think there's still a place in the world for the more traditional firm that kinda of does that strict eight to five, everybody's there in person, just that I, old I school mentality? So. I don't think so because the world has changed. You know, let me ask you, do you think that there's room for a firm that does not have cell phones? Do you no. think there's room for a firm that does not have, uh, a, you know, com- personal computer, you know, uh, I guess laptop or notebook computers? No. Do you think there's room for a firm that doesn't have high-speed scanners? Well, no. there's there no room for firms that don't keep up to date. I, I just mentioned three pieces of, of hardware that, didn't, that really didn't exist 20 years ago. Things are changing rapidly, and you, you've got to change just to – you have to change just to keep up with everybody else. The staff – the staff we hired today never never lived their life without a uh, cell phone, without a uh, smartphone. They, they never spent a day of their life without a smartphone. They didn't have iPhones, but they had other things. They had Blackberries, 
palms, whatever. Uh, they, they, everything they do is digital. Even the way they communicate, even the way they talk to you, it's, it's all in code and, and digital. This is the reality. I'm not saying it's better. I'm not saying it's worse. It's different. And, and you have to, if you want to attract these people and you want to keep them, uh, you, you've got to be what I would, I guess, state of the art. So, so it's a necessity. It's not, um, it's, it's, it's not just fooling around. It's not, you're not a computer geek, you know. When, when VisiCal came out in 1980, VisiCal made the PC industry explode because all the accountants now had a spreadsheet that they could, do, you know, run their numbers and they all bought PCs. Uh, so in 1980 was, you might say, was the first personal computer. Around 1982, I think, was the first portable computer. And then it became bigger in 1984 when Compaq came out with a 30-pound portable, which I bought uh, and used. I, I, in 1982, I bought a K-Pro portable. And now, and these things weigh 30 pounds, and I was, I was so thrilled to have it. Today they 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 weigh they weigh three pounds and people don't want them. They're too heavy. You don't have you know you used to have records. Records are making a resurgence. I guess that's part of nostalgia. The records were replaced by eight track tapes, which were replaced by cassette tapes, which were replaced by uh, by the CDs. None of those exist today. Yeah, and, and, I think, wireless. and I think you made a great point there too. Of it's not better it's not worse but it's different and it's not going to waste we've got to, the firms have to start to embrace this change and embrace this new mentality and the firms that don't embrace the change are, are not going to get the staff it's as simple as that but there yeah. but there are rooms for for tradition there are rooms for small accounting firms you don't have to be a large firm you could be a small firm but you have to embrace the technology i know some small firms People like Jody Pizar has a firm. She has virtually a virtual firm. We, we, as staff works for Jason Blumen, they, they have people that they never even see who work for them. Yeah. And they have people all over the country. I get artwork done in Indonesia, in Kenya. <laughs> I, I could, there's a thing called Fiverr.com. F-I-V-E-R-R.com. I, you want report covers, you want Speech covers, handout, want cartoons done, thirty, forty dollars in two days, and they're done in countries. Wow. Some of the one country I never heard of, <laughs> and a person turned around the thing in forty-eight hours, uh, a report cover uh, for a speech I was given. I, I, but we have a, I have a big art department at my firm. We, we have, uh, I think, fourteen people in our marketing department. Some of them. Three of them are, are tremendous artists. I could get them to do anything I want, but but there's a turnaround time. I, I get impatient with the turnaround time. I think it's for thirty, forty bucks. I get it myself. I, I go to Fiverr and I get it done myself. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, if it was a firm, you know, it's 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 the right image and everything. But you know, if I had time and read time, uh, a friend, if I want to put an ad into a charity journal. The art department, you know, gives it to me. <clears throat> but if I'm doing a, a, a speech for a um, for a local business group where there's going to be maybe 20 people, uh, I, 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 I get a speech hand out. I get a, I get a cover for 30 bucks. Well, put it on in two days. Bang, bang, bang. It's done. Things now are changing. Yeah, they are. And you mentioned Jody and Jason, kind of those smaller, more virtual firms. When we're looking at the younger generation just getting out of college, would you encourage them to kind of go with the path of a, a with them, go with a, a smaller firm, start on their own? Where do you see the, the, the young people come out of college gravitating towards in their career path? All right, Gary, you asked, you asked a question that is, is very good, and, I, I, and it gets me angry. I'm going to tell you why. The big four accounting firms hire 70% of the accounting graduates, the people who major in accounting. So these are people who go to college, and somewhere in their college career or college uh, path, 
they decide they want to be accountants. And the big four hires 70% of these people. Within three years, 90% of them leave public accounting. So the big four are destroying the profession, in my opinion. And I've written about this, so I'm not saying something that I haven't said before. Now, the other people have to choose be other than the big four. <clears throat> if you want a career in public accounting, you see, Witham is really a great firm. Uh, and, but I would not recommend, and, and if, there are a few firms like us, but there's not a lot, because there's a lot of firms our size who want to, who want to think they're competing with the big four. My firm, we, we, we're in a niche in our market. We're, 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 believe it or not, we have 850 people, but in the markets we're in, like in New Jersey, there's firms with 14, 1500 people who want to be like the big four. And then there are firms with 200 people that just don't have the resources to handle certain kind of size clients. So we're in a great position and we handle all size clients. So if they could get a job with a firm like mine, which again has a track record of keeping people, or I would recommend going to a small firm who, who hires people out of school and trains them. When I, I merged in uh, 12 years ago with, with them, at the time I had two other partners and we, we had 12 people working for us. Of the 12 people that worked for us, all 12 of them started their careers in what they did with us. Our bookkeeper, our office manager, or administrator, we had a full-time marketing person, a 15-person firm with a full-time marketing person, and I had nine accountants. Every one of these people we hired out of school. Now, I had a small practice, so I'm just going to tell you very quickly, we did the smallest level work or the lowest level work CPA firms could do, which I would say was QuickBooks Consulting. We also had public clients, so we did the highest level work that CPAs could do. So I had a small firm that did everything. Everything I did was with people that I trained out of school. And some of those people are still with me today after 12 years when we merged into with them. So what I'm saying is the right kind of firm that hires kids out of school and trains them, I think is the way to go. Also, I want to tell you, when people leave my firm, they move. People, you know, some people don't like it, so they leave. You know, you can't, not everybody. We have a very low turnover rate, but some people leave. They go to other CPA firms. When um, uh, people move to a different area of the country, they all get jobs with CPA firms. So my advice to young people is, if you you want to, you should work for a small firm, but find out if the people who leave the firm, where do they go? Do they, do they remain in public accounting or they, do they go to private? And I think that's how you could evaluate the firm. And the other thing is, like a firm like mine, how many people that start with the firm become partners? Well, my firm has been very aggressive acquiring other practices and bringing, you know, bringing in other people like me. Uh, so we have, of course, we have partners that didn't start with the firm, but Half of our partners started with the firm. That's how you rate the firm. That's the question they should ask. Because people that, that graduate college as accountants want to be accountants. Now, Barry Mellonside has now said that you have more people gra that graduate as accountants who don't go into public. They go into private. My advice is to stay in public, become certified. If you don't like it, leave. But I think you're going to like it because there are a lot of older people in public accounting, like me, we don't tolerate it. We love it. And there's room. There's room for anybody at any level, uh, at any uh, kind of effort and work they want to put in. So I, I strongly recommend going to public accounting firms. I would recommend small firms that have good training programs or, or there's few firms our size that, that really hire people and have a way of keeping them, not, not burning them out and having them leave the profession. Yeah, and I think that's some great advice because 
I agree with you. A lot of people aren't going ho to get in this profession, um, so they don't go into it, or they they pick the wrong firm and they don't have great mentors like you and other people to to lead them there and to encourage them to hey, this is why this can be exactly what you said. The people that do this love it because it's a tremendous job. So I'm hoping that our listeners, those young um, either CPAs or soon to be CPAs out there hearing this, get excited about the public accounting profession and don't leave it too soon because it is an amazing profession. I, I, I want to tell you something that Barry Melanson said this week that, that I have repeated, uh, not, not, I, I repeated the same thing, not, not because you said it, but the same thing. He, he was for CPA firm. Started out with a CPA firm, and he, and he was offered double the salary that he was making to go to private. But he liked being in public, and he went to the partner, and he said he, he got this job, he got this offer twice as much as he was making. He really likes the firm. Could he stay? What, what, what could they say? They told him how much money they were making. He stayed. <laughs> There, there are partners in small firms that routine. There's a lot of small firms that where the partners routinely make five, six hundred thousand dollars. There's a lot of partners in large firms where a lot of partners, not a few, routinely make more than a million dollars a year. The accounting is a very and and there was, you could have a. I say small firm. You could have a. Uh, you know, if you have a sole practitioner that works by himself, he's not going to make more than a couple hundred thousand dollars. But if you have a sole practitioner that has four or five people working, that guy could be making four or five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. He has the leverage. People got to understand that it's a great profession. It is a profession, but it's a great source of, of, uh, of making a great living. You're not going to get wealthy. You're not going to make, you know, four million dollars a year. You're not going to make what a manufacturer could make if you have a trademark product. But as a service business, we make more than uh, almost any other profession. Also, I, I give speeches to uh, or talks to high school kids. I always bring a young accountant with me, and one of the things we show them is, is our State of the Firm video. We have 200 kids dancing in the streets of Manhattan and on the subways uh, singing songs. Uh, but uh, I also tell them that the kind of money that people could make in public accounting, because in public accounting, you, you, you are the, you, you're the product that they sell to the client. In private accounting, you, you're, a, you're an overhead item. Yeah. So people leave public, they get a big raise, and then the raise is 2 3% a year. In public accounting, it's not unusual the raises to be eight to fifteen percent a year, depending on the firm and what you do and the way you grow. So it, it, yeah. money. Oh yeah, the other thing is, do you know that the the largest accounting firm does twice as much more revenue as the two largest ad agencies in the world combined? And there are three other accounting firms, basically their size. And the, net, the, the second largest accounting firm does more volume than the, than the third to the tenth largest ad agencies combined. Do. Wow, that's a we're, we're in a we're in a big we're in a big business. We're in a very yeah. big business, and there's tremendous opportunities, and, and uh, you know the right people, the, the right people that join the profession, that understand it, and, and of course you, you get the right training and you got to contribute to the training yourself. If you're going to go to a client for the first time next week, get last year's financial statement and read it and, and, and go online and look at the website of the client you're going to. Even though you know, you might be the youngest person or the lowest person on the total poll, get a heads up on what the client does. That's all you got to do. It's not so much. So it takes you 40 minutes. Uh, a, you know, a couple, you know, one night before you go to client, that's how your career grows because you learn about the client. You learn about the client. We're in a client service business. If we don't service the clients right, we ain't going to have a business. That's some other excellent advice for our audience that, yeah, it's something that those newer people in the profession, the firm might not tell you, but Ed hit the nail on the head of research the client, learn about them, 
be ready for it. Because at the end of the day, we don't expect you to know everything about the client or the tax code, but if you can know about the client and what happened last year, you're going to set yourself up for success. I'll tell you something that just happened. I uh, I got a lead on a uh, very large not-for-profit client. So I take it, I, I asked one of the partners in my office uh, to, to, if he would go with me to meet the client. So he goes online and he researches, the, the, he looked at the, uh, the 990 that's online. He saw, saw the size of the firm, what the revenues are, what they paid a prior year's accountant, what they paying the accountant. And he sees what, and he gets their website, sees what they do. Well, we have a client, we have a partner in our New York office that, that specializes in that industry. And she actually knew some of the organizations that this, uh, not for profit supported. So the three of us are, are, have a meeting Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, to, uh, to meet with the, uh, client. And, and this is because, uh, I don't want to say kids, it's because this young partner, this young person, went online to look at the website of 99. I don't know. It could have taken them more than a half hour. And now I think we're, I, and now I think we're going to be assuring to get the client, because when I mentioned to, to the prospect who I was bringing, she heard of, uh, the client that's tied into the industry. I would have known that, well, I would have, I would have researched it myself, but he beat me to the punch. And he sent me, you know, copies of what he found. But I would have done it myself. But I turns out I really didn't know that I didn't know the partner that that that's tied into this. She she joined our firm a few months ago, and I'm not even met her. But this this younger partner met him. Yeah. So you got to do the work. You got to do the work, and it's not hard, especially now with the uh, with the technology and. You get enough for profit. You you can get the 990 in in four minutes. Yeah, it's, it's very you know guide star. For those of you that don't know, guide star. Guide star. Guide star. Um, yeah, you go to guide that's free, and and you, everybody has a website. You, you look at their website, see who the offices are, see what their mission is, what they do, and see who they if it's enough for profit who they support. If it's a manufacturing client, see what what industry they're in, what kind of product they sell. They, they sell to other manufacturers or they sell to uh, to distributors or, or direct to retailers. And you get a, you get a, a heads up. You, if you get a client like Amazon, which you're not going to get, but you get a client like Amazon, and and you, you've got sales tax issues in, in 40, 50 states. You got Nexus issues. Where do they keep the, the inventory? I'll give you another example. There's a there's a company that sells eyeglasses online. Well. They have a deal. You want eyeglasses, you, you could pick four or five, they'll send you the four or five eyeglasses uh, with your prescription. You try it out, you pick the one or two that you like, and, and you return the rest. They, they found out that people pick three. They would normally buy one, now they buy three, and they return the other two. They have inventory in every state that they ship that, that stuff to, because they own the stuff until it's bought. They now have sales tax issues, and they have they have to file income tax returns in every one of those states that they ship stuff. Now you might say it's de minimis, but but when a company doing business on the internet, yeah, at that scale, you know, it's not the minimum. It's the minimum that they send it to me, but if they send it to 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 five thousand me's in in each of fifty states. They got substantial amounts of inventory. You get a, you're trying to get a client like that, and you point it out to them. You're going to get it because you know you understand their problems and you understand their industry. And if you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, you're never going to get the client, no matter how nice you are and how presentable you are and and, and how great you say your firm is, because you can't fill the needs of the client. Yeah, it's, about, it's about, about being client. prepared, being ready, understanding the client. That's now, right. Ed, you're clearly a, you're clearly a busy man who's got a lot going on. Um, do you think you ever hit a point in your career where you uh, relax and, and scale back, or how are you going to define success and when it's time to slow down? I I I, uh, I have a lot of energy. I'm, I'm not so young. <clears throat> you can't you can't believe how much I do. We were talking a little bit about it, but I love what I'm doing. I I I did scale down because I don't handle. Uh, 
I don't handle clients that have compliance deadlines. I don't handle clients that need financial statements. I don't handle clients that need tax returns. I, I do consulting. I do special projects. I could do an estate plan, a succession plan, a valuation. I don't do forensic work because I don't want to be tied down to a lawyer's schedule when I have to be in court. Okay. So I could pick and choose, but, but let me tell you, uh, I've been in this a long time. When I reached for it, when I was 40, somehow it dawned on me that I was 40, and if I wanted to change my career, that, that would be the time. You can't wait till you're 50 to change careers. And I really did a self-assessment, I would say for about six months, of um, trying to decide what I wanted to do. And, and my decision was that I loved what I was doing. I wanted to stay in accounting. I wanted to continue more what I was doing. But I decided that I wanted to be more entrepreneurial and and not do the normal things that were considered traditional accounting, but go beyond it, doing more consulting, uh, you know, get more involved, hands-on, you know, advising clients. And I did that. I, I had Part, two partners at the time, and uh, by the way, I started a firm in 19 on January 1st, 1974. That uh, I left in, on June 30th, 1988. We had a third partner and 50 staff, and we did not buy a single client or merge in a single practice. It was all from internal growth. Wow! So, and, and a lot, of, a, a lot of the staff. Uh, we, you know, at the end, we were only hiring people out of school. So I, I talk, I write a lot, I talk a lot, I, I give advice a lot to other I, I only give the advice and talk about things I've done that have been successful. And, and it all works. You just have to understand that you're running a business. You, you have to make a living, so you got to do something. I don't have to make a living anymore, so I'm having fun. You know, I don't do everything that I would, would have done 10 years ago, but <clears throat> I'm talking about younger people. Uh, you, you're going to have to make a living. You might as well do something you like. You might as well do something that's challenging. The entrepreneurs who, who are the base of, of, <coughs> of, of every accounting practice. In fact, uh, President Trump said, said a couple of days ago, there's 28 million small businesses in the country that employ 56 million people. Every one of those 28 million, and these are, you can find small business for under 500 people. There's 42,000 CPA firms that, that have less than 30 people working for them. Many of them are one or two men. You might as well do something you like, something you enjoy, where you can make a very good living from. I think public accounting does it, has the, the opportunities for you to create your future, to create what you want to do on the way you want to do it. But entrepreneurs, without a doubt, are the smartest people in the world. These are people that, that have to have skills to, to have to have the technical skills to get the product produced or out. They have to have marketing skills to sell the product. They have to have a facility with, with financial stuff. They have to have people skills. They have to have negotiation skills. They have to be smart enough to hire the right professionals to assist them. Guys like me, the right kind of lawyers. They're the smartest people around and always thinking, always trying to grow their business. Where can you get a ground floor to these brilliant people if you're not an accountant? So to me, this is the greatest profession and uh, I, 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 had, I did not, I never had a bad day. Uh, in, in public accounting. That's a sleep of sight <laughs> occasionally, uh, but uh, never had a bad day and um, always went home excited, exhilarated, and looking forward uh, for tomorrow. And that's great. That's the exact message that we're trying to spread here with this podcast is get excited about public accounting. It's a tremendous opportunity, amazing industry. You can really be an entrepreneur in the accounting world now more than ever before. Um, you know, I went through a similar introspection about a year ago for myself. Hey, okay, what do I want to keep doing? Is it really this? Um, you know, and for me, it, it came down to I love what I do in the public accounting world, but I want to get more involved with the public accounting world 
and the community on a national level and how can I start to speak at conferences and engagements in state societies and and just help make this change and get this positive word out and get people, you know, reduce that huge chunk that goes to the big four and get more and more to come to these smaller firms that offer tremendous opportunities. Um, it's, like you said, it's a phenomenal profession. It's an amazing industry. A lot of change going on, but tremendous, tremendous opportunities for everybody. Actually, public accounting is also um, a tremendous uh you, you acquire tremendous knowledge, and a guy named John D. Rockefeller, which I'm, I'm sure the listeners heard of, uh, mm-hmm. his first job was as an accountant. Oh, didn't know that. Je- Jeffrey Chaucer, the guy that wrote the Canterbury Tales, worked as an accountant. There's an accountant. Moses had to hire an accountant to do an audit when the Jews left Egypt, and they built the, the first tabernacle. He had a high, he hired his nephew uh, Ithamar to to do an audit. There's accountants and there's audits in the in the New Testament. Confucius, you know, Confucius started as an accountant. Did not know that. The great, the great Chinese philosopher started as an accountant. Columbus, Columbus's first voyage had an accountant accompanying him, who was hired by Queen Isabel to keep track of the wealth. The guy, the father of accounting, Luca Pacioli taught Leonardo about the art of perspective, and Leonardo painted the Last Supper to employ all the techniques of perspective that Luca Pacioli, the father of accounting, accounting taught him. Wow. We have an unbelievable profession, a strong history. The first human writing ever were accounting records by the Sumerians in cuneiform 3,500 years uh, before Christ. The, the, the Academy Awards, the Screen Actors Guild, the Golden Gloves, all have accounting firms count the balance. Why? Because when they started the Academy Awards, after three or four years, people thought that the voting was fixed. And it lost credibility. They hired Price Waterhouse to count the balance to get credibility. We, we well, that's a great history lesson right there. We, yeah. we have a great, great history, a strong history. I told you before, accountants made the PC industry with, because when VisiCalc, we didn't invent VisiCalc, but we bought it and we bought PCs for VisiCalc. Yeah. Every accountant in the country now has a computer. The small firms, the small firms uh, started doing in-house tax preparation before the large firms. Because every small firm around 1988, 89, they had the programs of, that accounts could buy and use in their office. Yeah. No, they didn't we, have a choice. We, we jumped on anything new in technology. We were there first. Believe it or not. Well, that's great. That's great. Ed, I appreciate the time. We're almost out of time. Here.